<laughs> I'm thinking of calling my wife. What did I do? Um, uh, so tell me, for, first of all, um, tell me about the Penske acquisition. Um, and and let's, let's walk us through the change in ownership and sure. who's controlling what about the brand now. Okay, so dial back to 2017 and there were bad times at Wenner Media as a whole, mm -hmm. owned Us Weekly, Men's Journal, and Rolling Stone. Debt was just crushing the company and needed a way out. So they decided to keep Rolling Stone as the crown jewel, sell off Us Weekly and Men's Journal, and then figure out what to do with Rolling Stone. And Jay Penske uh, has a knack for taking uh, legacy print brands and reviving them. And he and Gus Wenner got together and said, let's figure out a way to, to bring this brand back. Mm -hmm. Jay bought 51% of the company. The other 49% is owned by a private equity company that handles international licensing. Okay. Um, so Jay owns a controlling interest of the company. He purchased it in December. The deal closed, and we've been integrating. I came on to, to bring it to the next phase. So this is a curious collection of brands that, that Penske has together. It's got Variety. It's got WWD. It's got Rob Report. How does this all fit together? Where does R Rolling Stone fit into this? What sort of synergies, especially on the digital side, are you actually supposed to realize out of this kind of combination? Well, it just continues to add to the scale of Penske as a brand. And most people know the individual brands, obviously. Uh, BGR is a tech Variety, Entertainment, Deadline, Women's Wear Daily, Fashion mm -hmm. News, Hollywood Life. So there's all those verticals, and uh, and Rolling Stone is the music vertical there. Mm -hmm. They also bought She Knows, too. So that was the other B2C property in the female category that they bought right after us. So strategically, what are you expecting, as you move into Penske, what are you expecting to be able to do now that you weren't able to do then? Well, the resources will be number one, right, under that debt. Rolling Stone couldn't invest in anything. Mm -hmm. And now having the ability to, to have the, that, those coffers from Penske and invest in the relaunch, which we did in, of the magazine and the, and the website and our events team, that's been, uh, that's been a help to us. Let's, let's talk about the relaunch. So you relaunched recently. Tell me how this site, um, because I've watched countless relaunches at Rolling Stone uh, and a lot of different models that the company followed. What was what's different about this relaunch, in t both for readers but also for advertisers? Well, overall, the brand has to get younger, right? We have to appeal to a broader demographic because, to your point, you were reading it a bunch of years ago. Mm -hmm. I won't say how many. Oh, 1970. <laughs> oh, I was, okay. I was 12 in 1970. Wow. All right. <laughs> yeah. um, but but we need to cover more genres of music to to introduce the brand to younger audiences, and that's the key. We invested in hip-hop and R&B and those demographics. Hip-hop's the number one music genre right now overall, so to be able to reach those demographics is key. Well, that, okay, that, that raises a question for me. Is it a matter of, um, how, how, do you really, how does an, an old brand, an iconic brand from the boomer years, really capture a newer demographic? Is it simply a matter of covering more music, or is there, are there other parts of the strategy there? How do you really make Rolling Stone seem uh, authentic and genuine? Uh, how, does, how does the old brand really speak to these newer and younger audiences beyond, you know, we can, we can show one of the covers, right? We can show, uh, wanna put up, uh, put up the, uh, the the one of the covers? There we go. Yeah, that was our relaunch issue. So okay. who would have thought that Rolling Stone would put out a cover like that for a relaunch, right? Mm -hmm. So doing stuff like that and also hiring different types of writers and editors. You know, if you looked in our newsroom 20 years ago, it was a typical older demographic that was writing, and still, even 10 years ago, it was that way. Mm -hmm. Now we're hiring much younger writers and editors covering these genres that understand how to write for a new audience. And then we use that with the SEO and SEM across Penske and, and the internet to reach those audiences. That's, what, that's the other pieces I want to talk about. What's the distribution piece when it comes to broadening the demo? Well, right away, it's within Penske. So at the bottom of every Penske site, there's a widget, so we're in there automatically. Uh, the distribution of our own content across those sites to reach those audiences for free, you know, that's very helpful. Uh, and then strategic partnerships, you know, having a brand like that is incredible when there are all these other platforms out there that are yearning for content. Mm -hmm. um, what, it's always, as I mentioned, Rolling Stone has always struggled digitally. And, and you say part of it is, is resources. What happens differently now? 
now that you're here, and you've got, you, you have loads of experience with digital first brands, right, that, that built from the bottom up digital first. Now you've got an iconic legacy brand that has to try to take some of those lessons and make them work. What's different this time in this relaunch? Well, I think it's, it's a company initiative. You know, I think uh, there, there are, the, the magazine is what it is and it will always be there because people love the touch and feel of a magazine. Our relaunch was with uh, Sean Mendez and one of the, the parts of the fact that he would agree to perform at our relaunch party was the fact he wanted to, to be on the cover. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't usually happen for us, but being Sean Mendez, much younger demographic, um, obviously right in the middle of mainstream right now, so he's gonna be on our December cover. Uh, and we're happy about that. It's great. That's great for us to have people like we have got Cardi B, Zoe Kravitz is in November, and then Sean Mendez in December. We had Aretha on October, obviously, because Aretha. Um, but from the website perspective, it's important to create content and then distribute it mm -hmm. and focus on it. You know, one of the things that we What's have that to do, it means like we have to be digital first. You know, we have to think about every time if we're doing the cover shoot for, for this issue, we have to have not just a photographer, but a videographer and then create that content that lives online and we distribute it and we drive traffic back to it. You know, normally we would have just been there with a photographer, shot a couple of, of pictures, created the magazine and been on our way. Mm -hmm. But we needed to have that, that content creation and then distribution because everybody picks it up. When you do a story like this and Cardi B posts in her Instagram this cover and it's one of her largest, highest liked uh, images in her Instagram feed, it's awesome for us. Mm -hmm. So that's all part of the strategy to make sure we're talking to the right people that are in mainstream. Any today. early evidence that it's working? Are you getting any metrics back that suggest where and how you're getting tra traction? Uh, our traffic is up year over year. Um, mm -hmm. We're excited about that. I think for from a corporate perspective, we just have to get out there and tell our story first and foremost. When I walk into a room, people are like, oh my gosh, Rolling Stone, where you been? Or mm -hmm. I used to read you, or you know, that's awesome. I, or I heard you guys were doing something. So we're really reintroducing the brand out there. Mm -hmm. Now, you're, you're just this, one of the strongest parts of your background online has been video. Um, that's sort of the through line, I think, for a lot of your, your work. Um, and video is another place where Rolling Stone went through a lot of different models. Um, the last time I had checked, it was very much into the, um, that we, we, have, we have contact with artists, we can bring them into the office, we can film them doing, uh, doing performances. Tell me about the evolving video strategy and where Rolling Stone has landed now in terms of how what, what video model content-wise works, and then we'll talk about the monetization So we're, we're producing video for every platform that we can, um, not just the website. And you're right, we would have people coming into the office all the time. We still do. But it's, we also have to create video for social platforms as well, which is huge. We have 15 million followers across three platforms. That's big for us when we put up a video of the shoot of Cardi B in our Instagram feed or on Twitter. That's big for us too. So we're thinking about video in every way in one-off clips, in B-roll, in original series. We're doing original series now that we never did. Um, well, tell us about that and, and what place that has in the strategy. So why not just a lot of, you know, one-off clips that go through the social feeds that, you know, get, you know, pile up the views. What's the strategy around these franchises and, and how you're investing in them? Well, people want to hear the stories of artists and, and musicians, and, and it's not just a one-off piece. You know, we, we did, we're doing a show called How I Wrote This. So take an artist, let's say Cardi B, just because she's there, and we're going to interview her about a song that she wrote, and she t takes us back to her hometown, and we see where she's from, and we see that she would be at this spot, and she would talk about, this is where I got the inspiration for this song. And those types of things are, are interesting to audiences that want to learn about the artists themselves. And different and better than simply another piece of performance. Yeah, I mean, they, they, there's so much content out there, right? I mean, if you want to see the American Music Awards, you're going to go online. I mean, you're going to watch it, although ratings were down, but you're going to go online. You're going to see any clip you want, any, anything, Bonnaroo, Lollapalooza, it doesn't matter. You right. can find content, but that's not really, that's, we're not going to win that game. You know, okay. we're not going to show concert footage and win that game. I, yeah, and I think that's important. And I think that's important about the misfire of the previous strategy of just having them come into the office. All it showed was, well, we know the artists. They love Rolling Stone. They love playing for us. We put, we put them online. Here, it's a deeper understanding and extension of the brand. We know them. They trust us. They let us into their lives. We can share that in a way that you're not going to get anywhere else. Right. And, I, and I think that's 
that's sort of a key evolution here. Yeah, is a better yeah. understanding of what a brand extension is for these for video. Great. Uh, how about the monetization piece, though? Um, that's about brands wanting to align with our brand and music and artists. You know, it seems like all the brands that we're talking to, and obviously not all of them, but most say our audiences are aligned and have an affinity for our product. If they look at the genres that are important to the brand affinities, they say music, sports, te you know, technology, which is where I came mm -hmm. from, um, comedy, a lot of cases, but music is always there. So once we have that common theme, then we start building out the plan and how we're going to reach the, our audiences for the brand. Uh, what, what pre roll sponsored, what, what formats? Work? Yes. Yes, okay. <laughs> Anything they'll pay for. Right, sure. Right. I mean, uh, the, we, we like to say yes. I have a joke, but I can't say it publicly about that. Uh, it involves my wife. Um, but, uh, but we like to say yes, you know, because brands want, they have so many different kinds of assets and, and, and uh, creatives that, that whether it's email, which is great, or whether it's through social media or pre-roll or mid-roll or in-stream, whatever it is, and video, but also display. But there are a lot of brands, now we're going to have a panel right after this that's going to drill into video, and a lot of true believers, for good reason, in video and in their models. But we also heard yesterday from a number of brands that are walking away from video, that don't find it viable, that find that the video advertising uh, ecosystem broken in some way. What's wrong with the ways in which brands approach video, or media brands approach video, and the advertising that supports it? Uh, from a media brand perspective, yeah, what's yeah. wrong with, with I think the cost structure is a little bit out of whack. People think that they can't produce video unless they're spending $50,000 an episode or more. And so the, the math gets a little wonky because you spent 500 grand to produce a series and then an advertiser only wants to spend 250 against it. So you're upside down already. That's a problem for a lot of, of publishers. So you really have to figure out how to create high quality professionally produced content at a lower cost so that you can monetize it more effectively. So how, did, how are you solving for that? Bring teams in house ourselves that we that we own, instead of outsourcing, um, and then just understanding what the cost structures are. I think that that's key for us. And and the the main forms of monetization then are, are, are again you said just about any just about any any model works. I mean, from or, a from a model perspective, I would say we we. There's integration, there's branded content, there's pre-roll, mid-roll. I mean, pretty much we can create a package for a brand mm -hmm. that makes sense for them. But where? Where do you monetize best? You make, you're not making any money on YouTube, are you? Uh, actually, only if we roll up PMC as a whole. So okay. we can sell PMC properties as a whole, and, and that's enough views to acquire the inventory ourselves and then resell it at a, at a premium. Okay, but you need basic, but most of the monetization is happening, would, the best monetization is still happening yeah, on the site? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how about Facebook? Um, well, they actually bought two series from us. So on the Facebook Watch platform, we're able to monetize there. Mm -hmm. And then um, we actually, it hasn't been a focus for us to sell in, in the Facebook stream. Okay. Um, uh, I want to move into, into talking about events because that's become an increasingly big part of this. And in fact, the video ties in, integrates and ties into the events. Tell us how, explain what the event structure is for, for, and how you're setting that up. Okay. Um, so there were, we always did our Super Bowl party. We've done that now almost 10 years. And uh, Lollapalooza, those were our two core events. And we decided to expand on that because of brands uh, want to put their product in people's hands at these festivals and at these events. So we created two different types of events. There's Rolling Stone Live, where we own the event, and then there's Rolling Stone At, where there is an event and we'll do something like the Artist Lounge. So you'll go to Bonnaroo, people will be performing on stage, they come off stage, they go into the Rolling Stone Lounge. We don't own that festival, but they like our presence there. We create this experience for artists and VIPs in this lounge area. So that's Rolling Stone at Rolling Stone Live, I mentioned before. We own a party. So at Super Bowl this year in Atlanta, we don't have anything to do with the NFL, but we'll do a three-day event. First one's an intimate dinner, next one's an intimate concert, and then our big bash on Saturday night, mm -hmm. where we'll be able to own the entire experience for brands. Um, what, I think we can, we can show... Let's show the, an example of how you, how you leveraged an event Great. in terms of video. Great.
amazing for them to be able to see me in a smaller environment. It's always a different kind of show, which, which is exciting for me. Give a warm welcome for Sean Mendez. I'm playing the entire set that we've been doing around the world, so it should be really, really fun. That was, Rolling, was that a Rolling Stone ad or a Rolling Stone Live? That was live? That was live. That, that was, was our live. relaunch party in Brooklyn, yeah. What have you, tell us about how this works. Uh, let's try or start with organizationally. Uh, what, what kind of a team, how many events are we talking about per year? What kind of a team have you, ha have you had to assemble to do this? So we can flex up and down on the number of events. We have a calendar that's probably about 25 events throughout the year right now. But... If we want to do an extra one, like we were talking to a, a handset manufacturer and they wanted to do something down in New Orleans at uh, the Voodoo Festival, so we could flex up and just and run that event there. We, it's not on the calendar. Or mm -hmm. we can come down off of a couple events. Um, so we pretty much have a framework, and then we have a team in-house. We have up to seven people mm -hmm. that come in and out of marketing, but the core is four people that run our events team, and then marketing flexes in and out of there. Now, what have you learned about monetizing these so that they're actually contributing more to the bottom line than just being a brand, a brand extension? Right. So the biggest thing that we learned is that while brands want to be at these events, they also need that content distributed. They can't just be there because there's 500 people or 1,000 people, and that's great, but there's no scale there for the brand. And if they're going to spend half a million bucks to be at Super Bowl or more, then that content, we have to create that content that they own and we own so they can mm -hmm. distribute across their platforms and get the scale that they want, and we can as well. So we put a strategy in place that will create five pieces of content from Super Bowl, we'll distribute it, we'll guarantee a certain amount of views against it, and everybody's happy. Give, but, give us an example of how that worked really well. Um, well, just started, but with the relaunch party for okay. YouTube Music. So we created a couple of clips from Sean and our interview and then we had a whole plan in place to distribute that across mm -hmm. PMC. And, so that's and also where PMC scale comes in, is huge. that you can then take those, those sort of videos and that content that's coming from events, and then you can leverage right. that larger right. scale. Like yeah. that could live on variety easily, mm -hmm. and, and the, the scale there. I mean, Penske's 22nd overall, 122 million uniques, huge scale, monthly. Um, what, uh, what else, other than content distribution and presence, are there other elements to, the, to what a, a, an advertiser buys? Must have integration of some kind. You know, the last thing they want is just their name up on the wall. You know, there has to be a way for the brand. With the YouTube Music one, we created these pods around the party where people could walk in and use the app to listen to Shawn Mendes' playlists or other artists that they, that they like. Mm -hmm. um, so it gave, this was right around YouTube Music's launch as well, so it gave people the opportunity to actually see what the app was about and how they would use it. So it has to be some integration that makes sense. What is, um, can you tell us anything about, in, in terms of just shares, what the revenue shares look like? I mean, in terms of what, what is contributing different shares to the, uh, to the bottom line? Yeah, so I would say print right now is like, you know, it was like this, and we're trying to have it come in for a soft landing. <laughs> um, print, there'll always be print, and, uh, and obviously it's down, but people still advertise in print. And we're hoping to get a certain amount of pages per month, and, and that'll be great. There'll be big, big categories that we should get, liquor category, pharma, um, there'll be ca automotive, there'll be big categories that we should get and there. And you're down, your frequency has changed, you're down to yeah, a monthly, Yeah, we went down right? monthly, monthly, right, right. So print's hoping to be like this, digital's like that. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we were nowhere a couple of years ago in digital because of what right. you mentioned in the open with Jan. So we're really excited about that because so many more brands want to get involved in the content that we're creating. Um, so we're pretty much, I would say, and then events, we're really just starting. Mm -hmm. So we want to eventually get to a part where we'll probably be, and I'm guessing here, but probably 25% print, maybe what's 60% digital and the rest event. Is, is digital revenue being driven mainly by video? Or is it, is no. how much is display no. part of Right this? now it's almost, it's like a, a lot display. Uh, uh, probably 85% display. Programmatic or direct? 
um, mostly programmatic because when I came in, that's when I brought the team on, the direct team, to get out there and have conversations. What have you learned about making that work, making programmatic work and making it substantial? Because I've had you on this stage many times over the years, and we've talked about programmatic, we've right. talked about the ways in which uh, agencies and brands are often squeezing publishers yeah. when it comes to the rates that they really are, are getting and the right. demands that they make. What makes it work for you? Programmatic doesn't yeah. work. It doesn't work. No, it doesn't work. I mean, everyone says, oh, we'll put you in our PMP. And then we look at how much spending there was at the end of the month. There was like $4.87. You know, so, uh, so no, it doesn't work. But right now, that's the only way for us to start getting involved with brands. So we at least get in there and we start talking about it. But then we have to go direct. There's just no, I don't know where people run when they say programmatic. And that's probably a whole different conversation for us to have. But it's not working programmatically for us. What's broken about? About programmatic? Yeah. Is this a setup? No, 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 it's not. I, I, no, I'm, real, I, I'm curious because, first of all, we're going to be talking well, about it more let, later. Let me ask a broader is question. A, Why is the trust between clients and agencies at an all-time low? Why do you think that is? I mean, because, well, because clients don't get it and the, and the agencies are doing something crazy and now there's a DOJ investigation into kickbacks. So something's going on on that side of the desk that clients are not really comfortable with. I'm not saying it all lands in the programmatic landscape, but that's a part of it, right? I mean, how can you have a buyer and a seller sitting right next to each other inside an agency handling clients' money, taking a piece off of both ends, you know? Well, the problem is when I talk to, uh, when I'm talking mainly on the brand side, they're all bringing more resources in-house, right. and one of the reasons they're doing it is not to deal direct with publishers because that's too unwieldy for them, is that they're doing it because they see programmatic at the core. They would in the beginning, I'm sure they do, because they understand the efficiencies of programmatic. But I would say that what they're going to eventually do is pay for the audience that they want to receive. And that's the challenge. Agencies right now are so pressured to make sure they're reaching efficiencies so they can make money that they have to press down pricing. And it's a race to the bottom for pricing. But clients are going to look at it when they see a landscape or they're in a PMP and they're going to say, I really want to reach this audience, so I'm willing to go to $8 or $9 on a CPM instead of the $3 that we're usually, usually seeing some fill at. So that's why I think clients are going to be okay with it, because it's efficient for them. They can automate their buying, but at least they'll raise their floors so that they can get to a price that, okay. that is effective for them. Well, from your lips to God's ears. Uh, I uh, now, I, saw it, I, I, I want to finish by talking about another piece that I saw recently, a little tab that's appeared on Rolling Stone called right. Rolling Stone Pro. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm, hearing, I'm, I'm seeing premium in there somewhere. What is that about? <laughs> So RS Pro, there's two things. We bought BuzzAngle, which is a list service. Um, it's, it's, I'll say Billboard does all kinds of rankings and lists, except Billboard doesn't have uh, YouTube stream numbers in it. So BuzzAngle encompasses everything. So when, you, when you're looking at stream counts, BuzzAngle will have everywhere that a stream is played and, mm -hmm. and rankings for that. Um, so there's a, a, a B2B application for that okay. for us. And that's really what RS Pro is going to eventually be, a B2B application for and us. And that could certainly play into variety. I mean, Definitely. That's got a, all of them. It, it Deadline, Women's Wear Daily, all the trade. Um, let, me, uh, let me open up. We have a few minutes for questions of, of Andrew and the, and the fate and future of Rolling Stone as a brand. In back. You know, we, we had an app at one point, but uh, we have so many other things to do first, and it's, it's hard to get scale on downloads of an app. So I think the first thing we have to do is get our ship in order on this side, and then we can potentially get into the app space. Do they, do they bring anything to bear uh, revenue-wise in, in terms of tech or team or process, or are you guys still sort of siloed? Well, each brand operates independently, but there are shared services. The programmatic team is a shared service, dev, product, all, uh, finance, obviously. All those are shared services across the top, and then we all operate from an editorial perspective and sales and everything independently. Do you guys okay. do much? Um, it, Rolling Stone is such a great kind of cultural brand. Do you guys do much in the licensing space to license the brand, the um, name, rather? That, yes. And no, actually. So there were 11 global licensed brands, RS Italy, RS Australia, and BandLab was handling those. That was the investor group. Um, but we're, we're 
restructuring and talking about strategizing around that. There's so much opportunity. We've done a, a couple of one-off executions. So last year was Rolling Stone's 50th anniversary. It was Levi's 50th anniversary. We did a custom Rolling Stone Levi's jacket to celebrate it and sold that. So there's opportunities like that on a one-off basis, but so many opportunities more broadly. If you guys fly United, you get off in LAX, there's a Rolling Stone bar there, a Rolling Stone lounge. So we're looking to, to roll those out uh, more broadly and so there's a lot of opportunity there. I want to, my, my exit question is, yesterday we heard a lot about diversified revenue streams, multiple revenue streams, going, trying as many ideas as you could. What I heard from you is three main buckets, print, digital, events. Is that right? Is that a strategic decision? To stay I think focused? right now it is, because sometimes if you, you go too far, you end up not doing anything well. Mm -hmm. um, so we must focus on those three things first and foremost, get our message down, talk to the marketplace, understand what they want, and then maybe we can grow from there. Okay. Andrew, as always. Thank, thank you thanks, very buddy. much. Thank you, everybody.